Good afternoon. Uh, hello and welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. My name is Michael Camilleri. Uh, I direct the Dialogue's uh, Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program. Uh, and today's discussion will focus on the explosive growth of private security uh, in Latin America. Uh, we're very pleased to be launching a new report, Security for Sale, Challenges and Good Practices in Regulating Private Military and Security Companies uh, in Latin America. Uh, which hopefully you all picked up on your way in. Uh, it's available in English and Spanish, uh, available also on our website. So please uh, check it out, read it, share it with your friends, uh, relatives. Um, uh, the report was authored by James Bosworth and Sarah Kenosian, uh, two seasoned experts on citizen security in Latin America. Uh, unfortunately, neither Sarah nor James uh, could be with us today. Um, they're elsewhere in the hemisphere. Uh, but we're very grateful for their work on this project. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, my colleague Ben Raidersdorf, uh, who, who helped to conceive this project and prepare the report for publication and plan today's event. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have partnered on this project with the Embassy of Switzerland. Uh, and we're delighted um, to be joined uh, today by the ambassador of Switzerland to the United States, Martin Dahinden, uh, as well as our good friend, uh, First Secretary Charlotte Bleich, uh, we are also grateful uh, for the support and the advice of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, I'd like to particularly acknowledge Margarita Studemeister here in the, in the front row. Uh, a decade ago, the Swiss government and the ICRC were instrumental in pioneering the Montreux document, a compilation of international norms and best practices aimed at promoting compliance with human rights and international humanitarian law by private military and security companies. Uh, we're very hopeful that today's discussion and this new report will help to advance the goals of the Montreux document in Latin America. Our panel this afternoon uh, will feature three distinguished experts on citizen security in Latin America. Claudia Paz, uh, Claudia Paz y Paz, uh, is currently Secretary for Multidimensional Security at the OAS, also a former Attorney General of Guatemala. Eric Tardif is a legal advisor at the Regional Delegation for Mexico and Central America for the International Committee for the Red Cross. Uh, and Adam Blackwell is Vice President of Development Services Group, a former Canadian ambassador, uh, and one of Claudia's predecessors as Secretary for Multidimension Security at the OAS. So in just a minute, I'm going to invite uh, Claudia, Eric, and Adam to join me on stage for a discussion about the report and the broader issue of private security in Latin America. Uh, bef before I do that, I'd like to Im invite the ambassador uh, here to, to give uh, some opening remarks. Ambassador, welcome to the American Dialogue. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here among you to discuss this very important topic. Private companies providing armed combat or security services are indeed not a new phenomenon. However, since the early 2000s, they have become increasingly important and more visible in battle zones. In particular, they have played a significant role in Iraq and Afghanistan. At that time, many voiced doubts about which legal norms, if at all, were applicable to those companies and their operations. That made it important to clearly demonstrate that private military and security companies were not operating in a legal vacuum, and that international law was applicable. For that purpose, and after a two-year consultation process, the Montreux document was finalized in 2008. The Montreux document recalls and reaffirms the applicable international humanitarian law relevant human rights and other norms, including the law of state responsibility and international criminal law. Furthermore, the Montre document provides a set of good practices that guide states when they regulate private military and security companies. The Montre document and the discussion prior to its finalization, focused on armed conflict. But the document 
is also applicable outside of situations of armed conflict, which is important for today's discussion. Since its finalization, finalization 10 years ago, support for the Montreux document was vastly grown, with 54 states and three intergovernmental organizations the European Union, NATO, and the OSCE supporting it today. Switzerland and the ICRC played an important role during the entire process. Those who participated in drafting the Montreux document wanted to engage in a regular dialogue on outreach and implementation. That is the reason why the Montreux document forum was established in 2014. In the meantime, this forum has held three plenary meetings in Geneva and one regional meeting in Costa Rica last February. The regional meeting in Costa Rica confirmed that the Montreux document is useful for situations outside of armed conflict and that regional organizations such as the OAS, CARICOM, and the Central American Integration System have important roles to play, raising awareness of the Montreux document and the challenges in regulating private, military, and security companies. Ladies and gentlemen, the Montreux document is an important document, but it is not the final word on private, military, and security companies. It is a contribution, not the solution. We should keep that in mind in today's proceeding. With those words, it's a great, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be among you this afternoon and to listen to the debate on the panel. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Claudia, Adam Eric, welcome again. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to speak uh, for about 10 minutes um, about the issue at hand, and then uh, we'll have a conversation among ourselves and, and obviously uh, invite those uh, in the audience to uh, offer questions and, and comments. I know we have a very um, an expert group uh, uh, of individuals um, here in the audience as well, so definitely want to, to leave plenty of time for that. Um, I know you're all eager to, to hear from our, our panelists much more than you're, uh, you're eager to hear from me, um, but I, I am going to monopolize uh, this microphone for a little while uh, just to present um, briefly uh, the report. Um, and um, I, won't, I won't attempt to summarize it. Uh, hopefully you'll, uh, I don't want to ruin the surprise, uh, so uh, hopefully you'll all take it home and uh, and read it, but um, I've picked out just five themes uh, that I think are are kind of central to the, the work of the authors in this report. Uh, so I'm going to run through them because uh, I think they're good starting points for the conversation uh, we're going to have. Um, the first theme is that, uh, and this, is, this has been mentioned, but the private security industry in Latin America uh, is an understudied phenomenon. Uh, Latin America is the most violent region in the world. Uh, and private security companies are imp an important part of the security landscape in the region. Um, those of us who spend time in Latin America sort of know this intuitively. We see it uh, at, at malls and banks and restaurants. Um, uh, but the numbers, the sheer numbers also bear this out. Uh, over 16,000 private military and security companies employ an estimated 2.4 million people in Latin America. Uh, private security personnel outnumber, in some cases far outnumber, uh, police officers in countries in the region, uh, and yet there is relatively little systematic study uh, of this phenomenon. The second theme uh, is that the prevalence of private security in the region is, is perhaps a natural outgrowth of the high levels of crime and violence in many countries, 
uh, but it also presents a number of challenges of its own, uh, and the authors identify a number of these. Uh, they include trafficking in small arms, excessive use of force, especially around extractive projects, uh, and more broadly and, and provocatively, uh, what the authors call an inequality of security, uh, the idea that when wealthy businesses and citizens are able to buy their way out of insecurity, governments uh, may have reduced resources and incentives to solve the structural causes of crime and violence affecting society at large. Uh, the third theme is that while Latin American governments generally have legal frameworks in place to regulate private military and security companies, they often lack the will or the resources to enforce these laws. Uh, so the result is a large number of security companies that operate in the informal sector and a failure to crack down on chronic bag bad actors, uh, such as those that allow weapons into the hands of criminals. Fourth, the authors identify the legal obligations and good practices in the Montreux document as a useful guide for governments in addressing the gaps in regulation and enforcement of the activities of private security companies. These companies will remain a prominent feature of the security architecture in Latin America for the foreseeable, for, for the foreseeable future, uh, and the Montreux document provides a framework for ensuring they are properly vetted, trained, supervised, uh, and held accountable in cases of wrongdoing. Uh, and then finally, the authors make a number of recommendations. Uh, I won't go into all of them. You can, you can see them at the end of the report. Um, let me just mention three, three threads. Uh, the first is to focus on enforcement. Uh, legislation is not enough. Governments must account for the resources and the regulatory independence to enforce national laws from oversight to adjudication. The second is to fo for focus these enforcement efforts on areas that have been particularly prone to abuse including purchases and shipments of firearms, off-duty police and military, moonlighting in the private security industry, and the use of private security to intimidate, and in some cases attack, uh, those opposed to extractive industry projects. Uh, and the third is to use the obligations and good practices of the Montreux document as a guiding framework in the effort to improve oversight and enforcement uh, of private security companies. Uh, and here, interestingly, the authors focus not just on Latin American governments, uh, but also uh, call on actors such as the international financial institutions, the OAS, and hybrid mechanisms such as MASI in Honduras, uh, NCC in Guatemala, uh, to do their part in strengthening the enforcement of regulations related uh, to the private security industry in Latin America. Uh, so with that as a scene setter, uh, let me turn first to, to Claudia Paz uh, for comments and reactions uh, based on her experience in civil society in Guatemala as Attorney General, now uh, leading the OAS's security work uh, for, for her reactions to, uh, to the report, or more generally uh, on this issue of uh, private security companies in the region. Claudia. Also, Claudia is going to speak in Spanish, I understand. So if anybody needs a headset, uh, we have those available uh, in the back. Gracias, Michael. Buenas tardes a todos y a todas. En primer lugar, muchísimas gracias por la invitación a debatir sobre un tema que no podemos afirmar sobre él menos que es muy vigente respecto a los aspectos de seguridad en América Latina. Y también inicio felicitando por el informe a, a Sara y a James. Creo que es un informe muy completo que de una forma muy resumida llega a destacar los aspectos claves en cuanto a empresas privadas de seguridad en, en la región. Voy a referirme a algunos de los aspectos que están contemplados eh, en el informe porque considero que su importancia es fundamental. También quiero aclarar, como ya lo hiciera el señor embajador, que la realidad de América Latina nos lleva a pensar en empresas privadas de seguridad más que en mil empresas militares o la, militarización, la privatización de ejércitos, porque no es parte de la seguridad del escenario en América Latina y también con la salvedad de que estamos hablando de eh, estados territoriales, estados en los cuales, siguiendo la nomenclatura de, del documento de Montreux, estados en los cuales operan empresas privadas de seguridad que muchísimas veces son empresas también eh, nacionales y estamos hablando insisto, de seguridad privada en situaciones de no conflicto. 
aunque por supuesto las directrices del documento de Montreux con, contienen parámetros generales que por supuesto también son aplicables a esta situación. Inicio también con, con una aclaración muy importante y es que la seguridad ciudadana es un bien público y esto significa que es una responsabilidad primaria, principal de nuestros estados. Incluso los estados modernos se definen porque ejercen el monopolio del uso de la fuerza. Entonces, cuando hablamos de empresas privadas de seguridad, ya estamos hablando aquí de una desviación de este principio general que la seguridad es una responsabilidad de los estados. Y ya Michael lo describía, en los últimos años, sea porque es un negocio floreciente, sea porque el estado no llega a, a todos los espacios de su territorio, sea por el incremento del crimen organizado, de la delincuencia, lo que he, a lo que hemos asistido en la región es a un aumento de la industria de la seguridad privada, tanto en cuanto al número de vigilantes privados frente al número de policías y también en cuanto al tipo de armamento o de tecnología a la que tienen acceso en nuestras policías regulares y las empresas privadas de seguridad. Y quiero resaltar eh, un elemento al que hace referencia el informe y es que podríamos pensar que estamos en una zona carente de legislación, pero no es así. En los últimos años se ha incrementado, la mayoría de los estados han aprobado normas respecto a las empresas privadas de seguridad, a lo que asistimos es a una inefectiva aplicación de estas normas, a un inefectivo control y evaluación de la seguridad privada. Voy a, a mencionar también algunos de los números que, que están contemplados en el informe, porque nos dan un panorama de la situación. Eh, fuerzas policiales versus eh, personas empleadas en empresas privadas de seguridad. Las cifras, en, estamos hablando de México, Colombia o Brasil, incluso a veces superan a las policías federales. En Brasil dice el informe que es 1 a 4, en Guatemala 1 a 5 y en Honduras llega a ser 1 a 7. Y tenemos una alta demanda del de servicio de seguridad, siempre sin, con una, eh, por decirlo de alguna fo forma, una oferta limitada de parte de los estados y esto en, en algunos momentos nos ha llevado a una situación de un cuasi libre mercado en el que desafortunadamente se prioriza el precio frente a la calidad de servicios que pueden, que pueden brindar estas empresas privadas de seguridad. Un, un segundo elemento que recoge el informe y que yo creo, considero que es fundamental es que, en palabras del informe, hay una superposición público-privada. Muchas empresas privadas de seguridad, y esto nos llama a reflexionar sobre eh, los montos de los salarios de funcionarios públicos en el ámbito de seguridad, muchas empresas privadas de seguridad contratan, sea miembros del, de los ejércitos o miembros de la policía en activo, o sea, policía de día y guardián de noche, y esto tiene, tiene un problema esencial, y ustedes coincidirán conmigo, que existe un evidente conflicto de interés de una persona que, por un lado, es funcionario policial y por el otro lado se encuentra contratado en una empresa privada de seguridad. Y esta superposición pública-privada también desdibuja las fronteras de hasta dónde llega la empresa y hasta dónde comienzan las fuerzas de seguridad públicas, cuánto acceso tengo a recursos públicos, cuánta información eh, privilegiada tengo si estoy contratando personas que están 
en activo. Otro, otro elemento que destaca el informe y que quiero compartir con ustedes es la falta de profesionalización de las personas que acceden a las empresas privadas de seguridad. Ha habido un esfuerzo enorme de los estados en América Latina de profesionalizar sus policías, de poner filtros muy estrictos para el ingreso de funcionarios a las fuerzas, de personas ciudadanos a las fuerzas policiales. Han habido eh, etapas de capacitación mínima para que un policía pueda salir a la calle y sin embargo cuando vamos a las empresas privadas de seguridad, por supuesto que no existe uniformidad en los currículos de formación, no sabemos cuántas horas de formación mínima tienen, no sabemos cuáles son los contenidos, la currícula básica, para que una persona pueda eh, utilizar un arma y asegure su correcta utilización. Otro problema grave en, en relación a las empresas privadas de seguridad es que muchas, eh, aunque existe una obligación de parte de los estados de que se registren y registren a las personas que las integran, muchas no se registran. El informe cita un dato de Ciudad de Guatemala, que el 30% de empresas privadas de seguridad de Ciudad de Guatemala operan la clandestinidad y aunque estén registradas, no registran a todo su personal. Quizás porque les es difícil hacer transparente que están contratando funcionarios que a la vez son policías o militares en activo o porque no ha existido un adecuado chequeo o mínimo chequeo de antecedentes y podrían haber contratado a personas que se han visto involucradas ya sea en, en delitos o en violaciones a derechos humanos. Y eso, y eso me lleva a, al último de los elementos del informe que quiero compartir con ustedes y que quiero subrayar, y es que existe una preocupación por parte de los autores del informe que es compartida y es en si estamos con personas que no han tenido o un adecuado, una adecuada verificación de sus antecedentes, que no han tenido una, un mínimo entrenamiento para utilizar las armas, por supuesto que estamos frente a un alto riesgo que existan abusos en el uso de la fuerza. Abusos en el uso de la fuerza que esto lo comparto y puede ser objeto del debate, muchísimas veces se incrementa más en las empresas privadas de seguridad que funcionan en el interior del país, en zonas alejadas. Quizás existen unos mayores controles para aquellas empresas privadas de seguridad que funcionan en los centros urbanos. Y eh, en este caso eh, podemos hablar de desviaciones como grupos vigilantes de vecinos, como organizaciones paramilitares y casos de empresas privadas de seguridad que, se, que tienen bajo su mandato el cuidado de, por ejemplo, hidroeléctricas o empresas extractivas que, por ejemplo, en el caso de Guatemala um, han eh, incurrido en no podría decir violaciones a derechos humanos porque no son ellas mismas Estado, no lo violan, pero sí en graves delitos como asesinato. Uno, uno de estos casos ocurrió el primero de mayo del 2012 en la zona eh, norte de Guatemala. Fue asesinado Andrés Pedro Miguel y gravemente herido Antonio Pablo, dos ciudadanos que se oponían en aquel entonces, hablo de 2012, al funcionamiento de una hidroeléctrica. Se hizo, en aquel momento yo era fiscal general, se hizo una investigación exhaustiva, fue una investigación rápida y efectivamente se detuvo con evidencia balística a dos eh, miembros de una empresa privada de seguridad que habían en este actuado, en este caso actuado en contra de ciudadanos que protestaban eh, por eh, la, eh, la actuación de la hidroeléctrica en esta zona. En este, en este caso en particular, desafortunadamente, 
todavía se está esperando que estas personas enfrenten juicio. Termino diciendo eh, con la reflexión de que si bien contamos con regulaciones, estas no están siendo efectivamente aplicadas y eh, un minuto para la labor de la OEA en este tema y acá espero contar con los insumos de Adam eh, revisando minuciosamente los mandatos que le han sido otorgados a la Secretaría de Seguridad Multidimensional en los últimos años respecto a empresas privadas de seguridad encontré uno tú me corregirás si hay más Encontré uno que es de la misma, la misma es la reunión de ministros de seguridad, la misma uno en 2008 en Ciudad de México, que eh, mucho coincide con una de la recomendación del informe. Y la recomendación es profundizar nuestros conocimientos sobre los servicios de seguridad privada, así como desarrollar y o fortalecer, según sea necesario, normas jurídicas que regulen su funcionamiento. Este documento de 2008 fue incorporado en la resolución de la Asamblea General del 2009 y eh, con eso termino. Estoy segura que es una base para el trabajo desde la OEA en, en este tema que es tan importante para la región. Muchísimas gracias. Excelente, como siempre, Claudia, muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much. That was great. Um, Eric, uh, if I could turn to you. Um, the ICRC obviously was instrumental uh, together with the Swiss government in, in pioneering the, the Montreux document. You're now on the front lines working uh, on these issues in Mexico and Central America. Uh, what does it look like? What's your perspective? Uh, what, what needs to happen to be able to make these, these obligations and these, and these good practices reality uh, when it comes to Uh, the, the enforcement that Claudia mentioned, which is so important. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure for the RCRC to uh, have the opportunity to engage with all of you today, uh, especially considering that uh, the RCRC was involved in the drafting of the actual uh, multiple document. Uh, I want to take this uh, opportunity to also uh, congratulate the team uh, for the Uh, the report that is uh, published today uh, is very obviously interesting. It provides a good overview of uh, the reality for uh, several countries uh, that are uh, uh, clearly identified in the report and also the challenges uh, that need to be attended. Um, this event, today's event, uh, helps uh, underline the importance of ensuring that private military and security companies which we often refer to as PMSCs, are appropriately regulated by states in order to ensure that human rights are protected at all times and that international humanitarian law, which is the law applicable during armed conflicts, is um, respected whenever applicable. Uh, at the SRC, we've seen the severe humanitarian consequences that can occur when private companies operate without clear boundaries in states, laws, and regulations. We believe that it is fundamentally important for states to ensure that whatever private military or security companies are permitted to operate, states take all necessary measures to ensure that these companies actually improve and do not neg neg negatively affect the security of the communities where they work. Uh, my remarks were first addressed the reasons why the Montreux document was developed and how the process came about, and then I'll discuss the nature and scope of the Montreux document. And finally, I will focus on the statements of good practices, which are so important uh, in, in, in the topic that we're, uh, we're touching today, um, that we find in the actual document, and in particular on how they can help states in regulating private military and security companies. Um, so at the outset, uh, allow me to recall that why and how the, the document was developed. The idea came uh, in the early 2000s, beginning of the century. Uh, at that time, we saw an increasing use of PMSCs by parties to armed conflicts, uh, and there was the misconception among various actors that PMSCs were operating in a legal vacuum, somewhat unregulated by international and national law. Uh, the humanitarian concerns re uh, resulting from the use of PMSCs 
uh, and the need to clarify exa existing legal obligations of states relating to the activities of PMFCs during our conflict led the RCRC and Switzerland to launch an international initiative on the subject. Under this initiative, five meetings uh, took place between 2006 and 2008, and we uh, concluded, uh, consulted also representatives from civil society, uh, very important, obviously, and from the private military and security industry. Uh, as a result of the initiative, in September 2008, 17 states adopted the document. Very long uh, name, Montreux Document on Pertinent Legal Obligations and Good Practices for States Related to Operations of Private Military and Security Companies During Armed Conflict. The document was open for, open for subsequent endorsement by other states and intergovernmental organizations. Uh, the ambassador uh, already stated the, the, the number of uh, states that have subscribed, it, subscribed the, the actual document. Uh, it's also worthwhile to recall that the challenges posed by PMSCs have been on the agenda of the OAS, as uh, Dr. Paz just mentioned, in uh, that uh, June resolution of 2009. Uh, and, and so um, it's, it's evidently something that is uh, of interest for the continent. Um, now, uh, the nature and the scope of the actual document. Uh, it's an instrument which is legally non-binding, which is very important to, to, uh, to mention. Uh, it's not a treaty or an international agreement. Um, also, uh, it recalls existing legal obligation. It does not create new ones, which is also important to point out. Uh, the objective of the document is to, cl to clarify and underline the fact that under existing international law, including international humanitarian law and, and human rights law, states have obligations with respect to operations of PMSCs. In addition to clarifying existing international legal obligations of states, the document provides a set of good practices on how to regulate the activities of those companies in national law and practice. Second, the document uh, does not address policy issues such as whether the use of PMSCs is appropriate or ethical. That uh, this is for the states to determine. The Montreux document takes the approach of recalling that whenever PMSCs are hired or permitted to operate, applicable national and international law has to be respected. The document is also without prejudice to any other initiatives that states may pursue with regard to the regulation of uh, the companies, such as the work of the United Nations Intergovernmental Working Group on uh, PMSCs. Uh, precisely. Um, in our view, these initiatives are complementary uh, with the actual uh, Montreux document. Third, uh, the Montreux document has been developed primarily to address the use of PMSCs in armed conflicts. Indeed, uh, uh, this has been the context that gave rise to the Montreux document, uh, and it is stated in the actual title of the document. And it is also evident in the frequent, frequent reference to international humanitarian law, which only applies in times of armed conflict. The particular dynamics of PMSCs being hired to perform certain functions on behalf of a state that is engaged in an armed conflict uh, in another state's country, uh, territory is also reflected in the structure of the document, which recalls pertinent obligations and, and recommends good practices for states uh, on whose territory PMSC operates, called territorial state, states on whose territory PMSC is incorporated, a home state, and states that hire the services of the companies called the contracting state. At the same time, and obviously, uh, particularly important to stress here, uh, it has always been clear that the Montreux document is also of relevance for states that are not engaged in armed conflict. It's in, it is obviously the relevance for uh, the Latin American context. Uh, in fact, its preamble states that existing obligations and good practices may also be instructive for post-conflict situations and for other comparable situations and its relevance outside armed conflict is further emphasized in the introduction to the part of the document which describes good practices. Indeed, the Montreux document recalls and clarifies legal obligations of states not only under international humanitarian law, but also under human rights law, the law of state responsibility and international criminal law, which apply at all times. Likewise, a great number of the good practices provide guidance for states on PMSC's regulations at all times. Uh, before uh, I enter into more detail on, on the, what the, the Montreux document actually says, I need to provide one final qualification on terminology. The document speaks generically of private military and security companies. What is meant by that term, uh, and here I quote from the document, are private business 
entities that provide military and or security services, irrespective of how they describe themselves, what is essential is the type of services that they provide. This means, for example, that a private security company that provides security for buildings or persons is precisely the type of company that the Montreux document addresses. There is no need for the company to provide military services per se. Uh, with, um, so what, are the, the, what, what does the actual document say uh, on rules and good practices? Um, so it's made up, uh, the, the document is made up of two parts. The first is a reaffirmation and clarification of the existing obligations of states with regard to the activities of PMSCs. And as I said, uh, the document addresses the obligations of uh, three types of states, as well as uh, certain obligations for all other states and obligations for PMSCs and their personnel. This approach is also mirrored in the second part of the document, which identifies good practices to guide and assist states in promoting respect for the law. In uh, very broad terms, the legal obligations that the document recalls in part one fall into three categories which are uh, states have an obligation to ensure respect for international law by PMSCs. They have an obligation to investigate and to address certain crimes committed by PMSCs. And if the conduct of a PMSC is attributable to a state, that state is responsible for the conduct of the PMSC. Concre uh, concretely, if we look, for example, at the obligation of states on whose territory a uh, company operates, at all times, that state has an obligation implement its obligation under international human rights law, which includes as a first step the adoption of legislative and other measures that obviously the, the, um, the report uh, stresses, um, which includes as the first step, uh, sorry, uh, measures uh, as may be necessary to uh, give effect to these obligations. Moreover, under uh, human rights law, states must also take measures to prevent, investigate, and provide effective remedies for relevant misconduct of PMSCs and their personnel. These obligations are based, for example, on Articles 2, uh, legis called legislation, and 25, effective remedy of uh, the American Convention of Human Rights. And we see, uh, obviously, a, a, a correlation with uh, the um, American um, framework um, to, and uh, obviously what also was resolved by the court, the Inter-American Court in uh, Velasquez Rodriguez versus Honduras. Uh, the Montreux document also recalls a state that states have an obligation to investigate and to prosecute, extradite, or surrender persons suspected of having committed other crimes under international law, such as torture. In the event of an armed conflict, states have uh, additional obligations, for instance, to ensure respect for international humanitarian law and to provide effective penal sanctions to address war crimes. The Montreux document further recalls that general international law provides rules uh, on when states are directly responsible for the conduct of private entities, such as PMSCs. These rules are particularly important when states hire PMSCs to perform certain services. Under international law, a state is responsible for the conduct of a PMSC if uh, it empowers by law a PMSC to exercise elements of governmental authority, which in the view of the International Law Commission may include, for example, certain uh, guarding functions in prisons or some aspects of immigration control, or if a PMSC is in fact acting on the instructions of or under the direction or control of a state. In addition, in times of armed conflict, international humanitarian law provides specific rules on when private actors are considered members of the armed forces of a state. I will not go into further detail here uh, on all the rules that the Montreux document recalls. Instead, I would like to stress that regulating the conduct of PMSCs in order to ensure that they operate in line with human rights uh, law and international humanitarian law is often complex, as shown in the uh, report, and requires uh, knowledge of different fields of the law. The Montreux document provides uh, one reference document that summarizes the main applicable rules in a concise and accurate manner, which we believe can facilitate this work uh, significantly. Uh, part two of the document describes a series of good practices that aim to provide guidance and assistance to states in ensuring respect for human rights law and international humanitarian law where applicable, and more generally promotes responsible conduct in the relationship between states and PMSCs. Uh, as good practices, these are recommendations and it is up to each state to determine which uh, practices are suitable and feasible to implement in its national context. Uh, those uh, kinds of uh, uh, good practices 
are, um, in, in the case of uh, the, the Montreal Document Forum um, events that are organized, uh, the last one being uh, in San Jose, Costa Rica, a few weeks ago, uh, there are very good uh, moments for states to exchange on these good practices and uh, possibly uh, make sure that uh, countries that have more experience in the implementation um, can uh, uh, give the countries that have less experience um, uh, share the, these uh, uh, tools uh, for the, 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 the correct implementation. Uh, the Montreal Document uh, good practices resolve around four larger uh, themes which have been proven essential in the regulation of PMSCs. First, uh, the document recommends that states should determine which services PMSCs are allowed to perform and which ones they may not perform. Second, the document recommends that states should set up a system under which PMSCs are required to obtain necessary authorizations for performing private security services. Likewise, if a state intends to hire PMSC, it should have procedures in place to assess the capacity of PMSCs to perform their functions in full respect of the applicable national laws and regulations. Third, the document suggests that states should define quality criteria, including respect for national and relevant international law, which PMSCs have to fulfill in order to be eligible to bid for a contract or to perform its services. This should include, for instance, that PMSCs have all the necessary licenses, for instance, for the weapons and other materials they use, which is a very important issue that is uh, uh, touched upon in the report, uh, that PMSC personnel have sufficient training to perform their function in accordance with the applicable law, including on the use of force if relevant, but also on questions such as complaints, uh, handling, or bribery, and that the PMSC has sufficient internal structures and regulations to ensure um, that its personnel complies with the applicable laws. Uh, lastly, the Montreux document recommends that states establish a monitoring system which is very important, obviously, for, the, for, for ensuring that uh, the actual system works, to ensure that PMSCs comply with their terms of contract or terms of authorization, as well as uh, national law and applicable international law in order to ensure accountability. Uh, in, in, let me finish, in conclusion, uh, by reiterating that since its adoption in 2008, the Montreux document has raised awareness of states' obligations with respect to the operations of PMSCs, and of the importance of adopting and implementing adequate domestic legislation. It, was also provided, uh, it has also provided guidance on how to regulate the activities of PMSCs in national law and practice. Uh, nonetheless, much remains to be done, as pointed out again in the report very uh, clearly. Uh, while several states, including in this region, have enacted domestic legislation on PMSCs, more states need to do so, and national laws and corresponding regulatory frameworks need to be effectively implemented. Another area requiring further work is ensuring the accountability of and oversight over MSCs and their personnel for violations of international and national law. Here a major challenge has often been the multinational nature of an important part of the industry. It is our sincere hope that this event will allow reflection on what has been done so far and what still needs to be accomplished. We believe that by strengthening the national regulation of PMSCs, states can ensure that their operation do not negatively impact persons with whom they come into contact. And against this background, the ICRC, the ICRC encourages states that have not done so to consider endorsing the Montreux document and to take the Montreux document as a guiding framework for national regulation and legislations. Both of these conclusions are obviously uh, also in the report, so we're, we're glad to see that uh, there is definitely some kind of synergy in uh, the thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you very much, much. Eric. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, I wish that my law school professors had been so clear and systematic in, uh, uh, in, in presenting, um, presenting the law. It was a great crash course in the, in the mantra document. Um, uh, Adam, um, you've worked on these issues from a variety of vantage points as a diplomat at the OAS, now as a it's a development expert. Um, we were talking just before the event. You said that this was one of the things you really focused on uh, when you were in Claudia's job at the OAS. Um, I take it that occasionally you found uh, a little bit of uh, <laughs> some challenges, let's say, in, in trying to um, elevate the importance of the issue and, and, and make progress on it. So um, maybe you can share your reflections uh, based on, 
on your experience there and elsewhere on, on the issue of private security. Great. Um, can everybody hear me? Good afternoon. I'll try and keep you all awake. Um, I'm not a lawyer, don't worry. And I'm not going to read all of this. Uh, I would like to thank the Swiss ambassador, the Swiss government. I seem to always be thanking the Swiss these days. I was just in Geneva at a conflict um, mediation uh, conference. Uh, and of course, the dialogue, because this is a really, uh, a really important uh, issue. Uh, it's daunting to be on a panel, on mi querida amiga Claudia and, and Eric. Um, it's all been said before, as they say, but just not by everybody. I'm going to go a little bit off script to not repeat um, and see if I can weave in what I was trying to do at the OAS in this discussion. A couple of days ago, there was a, a headline newspaper article uh, in the Washington Post, it said something like, uh, in Brazil, uh, the military are now providing public security services in some of the big cities like Sao Paulo and, and Rio de Janeiro. And the subcaption was, human rights um, are concerned, or human rights organizations are concerned. However, the citizens are rejoicing. And I think what... Um, that, that I agree with most of, of this report. And I have to say the conclusion started to give me palpitations because I thought, oh, you know, the horrible statistics on the one hand, but how on the other is the OAS going to uh, do more than just pay lip service to this because it's a real challenge in a multilateral uh, context. But I would flip it around and say, let's look at the challenges of public security because as Claudia has already said, this is a public good. There's nothing more basic uh, in terms of human rights than being able to live in security and safety. And as the statistics in the report, and we all know the LAPOP and the Latino Barometro and all of those uh, you know, perception surveys are horrific. And we still have 17 of the, most, uh, uh, of the 20 most violent cities on the planet. So it's going to be very difficult to reduce the impact of private security when we don't have public security. And I think there are, we need to perhaps look at it uh, a little bit more through that lens. Uh, don't get me wrong. I am very concerned about the exponential growth uh, and uncontrol uncontrolled and exponential growth of private security. I've written about it in my book and with, sorry, one of the competitors, the Wilson Center, um, in, in the past. Uh, we have raised this in numerous fora um, in the OAS. I just feel it needs to be part of a broader discussion of how public and private security can coexist in a professional, constructive, and innovative uh, framework. As Claudia mentioned, you know, how, how do you insist that there be no moonlighting of police and military officers if they are paid below poverty wages and they have no career structure? They're not being managed on a professional basis. How do you retain well-trained military and police if there are no incentives to stay in the service? I do fully support the Montreux document and the Swiss sibling, the International Code of Conduct for Private Security uh, Service Providers, better known as the ICOC. Uh, the challenge is that they are not legally binding. And I'm going to be really blunt here. Many of our member states are reluctant to approve or adhere to a document that was designed somewhere else without their inclusion. And perhaps one of the things, and I'm looking at the ambassador from Nicaragua here, we need to have a, a Managua document or a Montevideo document that takes many of the recommendations that we have here and brings it home and brings it into our uh, inter-American system and inter-American uh, fabric. Things like model laws, uh, for example, as Claudia po uh, correctly pointed out, there have been improvements. But is there a model law uh, out there, and how is it being implemented are things that I think we need to do in a much more uh, concerted effort in the, in the OAS. When I was at the OAS, and uh, it's not for lack of trying, believe me, we developed, a, or we tried to develop a framework to identify what are the components, what are the institutional components of a public security sector in a given country. 
in a systemic way? What's the ecosystem of a successful public security system in a member state? And then how do you systemically or systematically evaluate it, including private security? In fact, in, develop, in developing this methodology to both identify and evaluate, we built in many of the components of the Montpleu um, and the IC, ICOC uh, uh, documents. We piloted this in two countries um, of the region and found many of the same conclusions in the report that we are discussing today. Poor training, commingling of, of off and on duty uh, police uh, and military officers, the misuse of personnel and arms, abuse of authority and force, lack of accountabilities, and a spend rate that was astronomical of seven and eight to one. Very difficult to track the spend on private security because it didn't, it just included the personnel costs, not the cameras and all of the other uh, bells and whistles and toys. Uh, in one country, we did a spot inventory of firearms of the police and couldn't find 40% of the firearms. Where are they? Where's the inventory? What's the, uh, what's the process to recover them? We also found, ironically, that or not ironically, but not surprisingly, that in most cases the private uh, security companies do not want public security. They're, they have not, no incentive to create public security. And vice versa, the private sector has no incentive to invest in public security because from their perspective they're paying twice. Why pay your taxes to create public security when you're already paying through the nose for private security? So we have this, you know, horrible dilemma uh, uh, in, in, in the region. My hope was that we could take this methodology to identif identify the various components of public secur security architecture in the and military, public and military uh, security architecture uh, in the hemisphere and turn it into um, a peer evaluation or an evaluation into a peer review process that could hopefully be politically acceptable uh, to member states. Um, and would, frankly, comply with one of the requirements of the Declaration of Hemispheric Security, which I think goes back to 2003, which is to track members' implementation of the Declaration, which did include private security and the, this creation of, of a public security uh, architecture. And as, as Claudia has mentioned in MISPA 1, and I think MISPA 5, um, there was, um, you know, haphazard attempt to try and, and get to grips uh, with the challenges uh, uh, of private security. In the OAS drug report of 2012, there was a fairly extensive, um, fairly extensive uh, review of the private security and their impact uh, on, on, on crime and violence related to the, uh, to, related to the drug uh, problem. And, and, Frank, and two of the scenarios which were companion reports to the OAS drug report, um, one called Together and the other called Resilience. Private security was very much a, uh, an important uh, part of this. Uh, as Claudia knows, um, and I'm very happy it's up to her to implement all of this at the <laughs> OAS, <laughs> the public security, um, we speak of it as if it were well understood and that all of these state institutions, as I was saying a little earlier, have been mapped out into a high-performing, uh, well-documented, well-understood framework. And there is clear lines of authority and interoperability between the military and the police and the private security. That, frankly, is just not happening. Uh, I've spent a lot of time at the World Economic Forum, where we've been working on what Dr. Klaus Schwab calls these transformation maps of trying to build this kind of institutional uh, architecture or webbing to see how we can uh, pull this together. Uh, it is very, very, very difficult. Um, the other interesting piece in this world work I've been doing with the WEF is that many of the military leaders, and there was a session in Davos called uh, Building the 21st Century Military, Many of the military ministers uh, and senior officials are concerned about this expansion of private security as a reputational risk problem for them because 
the civilians in these uh, theaters don't necessarily distinguish between you know, somebody who's legitimately wearing the flag and somebody who's not, um, and also retention, because private security tends uh, to pay more with less, uh, let's say, less, um, less structure. I just want to conclude um, my comments by saying private security is not all bad. And private security does have a role. <coughs> if we ever want to get to grips with this, we have to look at this from their perspective as well. There are some highly efficient, highly innovative private uh, security companies who have a lot to teach the public security uh, practitioners themselves. It's how we weave this together in a way that is not seen as threatening, I think, is the way we're going to get uh, to uh, the bottom of this. So I'll stop there. I hope I was under time. I Great. promise to be under time. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. Um, operating on gringo time. <laughs> Swiss time. Not, Swiss time. There you go. <laughs> Swiss time. Um, Claudia, maybe I could just get you to react to a couple of things that, that Adam said, um, which I think are provocative. Um, certainly, I think he's, we would all agree um, that the issue needs to be approached in a holistic way, that, that um, coming to grips with the role of, of private security uh, uh, requires better public security. Um, and yet, he mentioned, and the report goes into this as well, there's sort of this uh, private security industrial complex that's built up uh, in which the incentives for the industry itself are not necessarily to have a, a, a more effective public security uh, system. Um, that uh, whether it's through lobbying or through um, uh, measures, in some cases, that are more insidious and, and tend to uh, foment higher levels of crime and violence, their, uh, their business incentive oftentimes, uh, in the case of the unsavory ones, is, to, um, uh, is for um, public security to be weak, uh, and therefore for their own, um, uh, their own business model to be, to be more necessary and more successful. Um, so how do you, it's sort of, a, there's sort of a kind of a chicken and egg uh, problem to some extent with this. How do you think about beginning to kind of break Sí, eh, gracias Michael y me quedé pensando justamente en, en la paradoja, ¿no? ¿Qué incentivos hay para las empresas privadas de seguridad en colaborar con que haya más seguridad? Cuando, si bien es el bien que ofrecen, si ese bien se expande en todas las eh, fronteras del Estado, pues sus servicios van a tener una menor demanda. Entonces, hay, hay un incentivo perverso. No voy a, a afirmar que exista un incentivo para provocar inseguridad, pero sí para eh, hacer claro y que se perciba que hay problemas de seguridad en los países, en los estados. Y a la vez, por el... el los recursos que se pagan para la seguridad privada, nos damos cuenta que realmente no es un problema de que sean eh, países o estados con pocos recursos, porque si esos recursos se emplearan para la seguridad pública, pues habrían policías mejor equipadas o podrían eh, eh, ampliarse los servicios de la policía o se podría mejorar el sistema penitenciario, que en una visión holística tiene muchísimo que ver con temas eh, de seguridad. Lo que creo que sí hay que señalar es que cuando la seguridad eh, se inclina más hacia la seguridad privada y es las empresas, son empresas privadas de seguridad las que prestan mayoritariamente este servicio, lo que tenemos son islas, pequeñas islas, colonias eh, amuralladas con garitas de entrada y salida, o cápsulas, personas que están protegidas, que no pueden dejar estos pequeños entornos e ir a la escuela, ir a la tienda, etcétera, y no eh, inmediatamente cruzar de una zona de relativa seguridad a una zona de alta inseguridad. ¿Cómo se ha enfrentado? Pues en algunos países se han creado impuestos específicos 
eh, para eh, equipar mejor a las policías o emplear mejor polic más policías o invertir en cámaras, en tecnología y estas inversiones que son públicas y que eh, por ser impuestos específicos pueden dar resultados rápidos y visibles han, han hecho como que los ciudadanos se den cuenta de la paradoja de lo que cuesta invertir en la seguridad pública y lo que les cuesta pagar la seguridad privada y las ventajas y desventajas de, de una y otra. Excelente, gracias. Um, let's go ahead and, and open it up. Uh, we've got about 20 minutes left, so we'll take three questions at a time. Uh, please introduce yourself, and if your question is directed to somebody specifically, uh, please uh, mention that as well. Let's start with Eric. Eric Jacobstein with the House Foreign Affairs Committee. I want to sort of follow up on this issue of incentives. I mean, you know, for me, this is the first I've heard of the Montreux document, and I, like many people here, work on Latin American security. Um, so, you know, it seems to me it's not something that private security companies are very focused on. So, you know, in terms of incentives, is there, would there be space to use bilateral relationships, foreign assistance, for example, assistance to Central America, condition it based on certain regulations by private security? having the state regulate private security, um, not just from the United States, but from the EU and other donors? That's the first question. Then the second is, are there any countries that you would look to as models um, in dealing with private security, whether in Latin America or, or in other regions, um, where you could really learn from best practices? Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Hi, my name is Alejandro Gonzalez. I am a grad student at Georgetown University. So my main concern is not only in terms of the correlation between violence and the growth of these private security groups, but also in terms of the um, conditions in which uh, these private security groups are working. Because as we know, they don't have unions, so they will probably are working, uh, receiving violence from their bosses. They have like overdose of working hours and also they receive like low wages. So there's a certain guidelines in terms of the ethical behavior that they have to receive from their bosses or the working conditions that they should have. Or something about that, the question is open for the panelists. Thank you. Up here in front. Hi, my name is Rene Pinilla. I'm a student at uh, George Washington University, and my question is relating to the Northern Triangle. How do you start um, cracking down the problem, uh, the biggest security problem in the Northern Triangle when it comes to violence and immigration to the United, to the United States when a lot of it is ingrained in the culture, I mean in the politics, most likely? wants to start? Adam? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, these are all very good questions and all very complicated questions. And, and frankly, I, I would be a fool to suggest that I have uh, answers. Um, I don't think we can force the Montreux Protocol document on member states. I think we're going to have to do uh, this through some kind of a peer uh, mutual evaluation mechanism. We have uh, very solid examples. For example, the, the, the inter-American drug strategy, uh, which member states agree on. There's a mutual evaluation mechanism, which happens, which tries to evaluate member states' implementation of that, uh, which I think should include. We could very easily include something if there was will uh, of member states on 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 private security. I think that would be. Um, that would be my uh, my suggested um, uh, route. Um, you know, th this nexus between crime and violence and private security, as somebody mentioned it earlier, sort of the inequity of, of security. I mean, what happens now is those who can afford it are okay. Those who can't are not. And that's not right. And that's not an acceptable public policy. So, uh, you know, the other thing that we were trying to do was look at the costs here. Many, 
governments, many Central American governments, say, oh, we don't have the money to do this. Well, you're spending this money today. You're just spending it badly. It's all going into the private uh, security realm rather than on a more balanced, uh, balanced approach. To come back to your question, uh, I spent the whole of yesterday in the District of Columbia's Youth Rehabilitation uh, Program. Um, I would say that the challenge really is stop deporting gang members to the United States. I mean, gangs were created here due to civil wars which were, you know, if for one reason or another, part of the Cold War. And the Cold War is over. And now we're deporting gangs back to jurisdictions which we've just talked about have no capability to deal with. So my suggestion is keep the gang members here. Let's implement restorative justice that works. And we've got many examples of that, whether it be in Los Angeles or New York or now uh, here in the District of Columbia in Montgomery County. And let's stop exporting in these, these problems. Because, I mean, there's no way El Salvador is going to be able to deal with the gang issue if we just keep sending more of them back. Sorry. No, I, no, I don't have to behave anymore. I'm not working for the OAN. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia, you do have to behave, but we want to hear from you anyway uh, on these questions. I think the three questions have been very, very accurate. I think it is possible to think about including, as well, condiciones para, por ejemplo, el otorgamiento de un, un préstamo o, o donaciones o ayuda bilateral, previsiones básicas, por ejemplo, que un, un policía de activo no puede trabajar a la vez en una empresa privada de seguridad o eh, incrementar el nivel de inscripción de las empresas privadas de seguridad o el nivel o la transparencia con la que operan. Creo que sí podría ser parte porque estas zonas oscuras de aquellas empresas que no, no, no se encuentran inscritas o que no reportan a todos sus miembros o que no reportan todas sus armas, son, son zonas que sin duda aprovechan la criminalidad y que inciden en un aumento de la violencia. Entonces definitivamente creo que sí se podría pensar en cláusulas. No, no podemos, es, un, es una realidad en el hemisferio. Entonces, no podemos pensar en este momento en un escenario donde no operan las empresas privadas de seguridad, pero sí podemos pensar en un escenario hacia donde debemos movernos, donde operan de una forma regulada y controlada por el Estado. Creo que tanto las fuerzas policiales, las públicas que se encargan de la seguridad, como las privadas, muchas veces no tienen las condiciones adecuadas para su funcionamiento y es algo esencial y lo mismo en la medida que tengan bajos salarios van a ser de una eh, forma susceptibles de ser cooptadas por ejemplo por el crimen organizado a mejores condiciones salariales mejores condiciones laborales es mejor el servicio que sin duda van a prestar hablo tanto de policías como de las personas que trabajan en empresas privadas de seguridad en, en realidades donde muchas veces no se vigila eh, la norma de los salarios mínimos, el cumplimiento de la norma de los salarios mínimos. Entonces estamos hablando de personas que tienen armas y que ni siquiera tienen eh, un salario mínimo. ¿Qué tan cooptables son frente al crimen organizado? Eh, Creo que la pregunta era la, la paradoja de inseguridad, inmigración, deportación. Y, y creo que es aún más complejo, porque aunque no únicamente se deporten aquellos eh, centroamericanos del triángulo, de los tres países del Triángulo Norte, que podrían estar involucrados con pandillas, el solo hecho de una deportación masiva rompería con los frágiles equilibrios de seguridad que hay en la zona. Y no, no lo afirmo porque se van a incorporar al crimen organizado. Son personas que no han vivido durante muchos años en los países 
y serían muy fáciles víctimas de las organizaciones del crimen organizado, de las pandillas o de los narcotraficantes, porque no son de ahí, no tienen arraigo, ya vivieron toda su vida acá. Entonces, sí una situación de expulsión masiva de centroamericanos, sin duda agravaría la situación de seguridad en la zona. Como fui fiscal, creo que lo que yo entiendo que ha sido efectivo para reducir el problema de seguridad en la región, y pongo el ejemplo Guatemala, que es lo que mejor conozco, pero Salvador y Honduras también, ha sido trabajo, un trabajo conjunto, policías y fiscales, investigación científica, investigaciones a largo plazo, desarticular toda la organización criminal, ir en contra de sus bienes, sobre todo confiscar el dinero con el que operan estas organizaciones criminales y aumentar las condiciones de seguridad en las cárceles y evitar el, el hacinamiento carcelario son como elementos mínimos de una estrategia eh, efectiva de seguridad. Gracias, Claudia. Eric, um, we've heard a couple of ideas about how to expand adherence to the Montreux document uh, in the region. Um, Eric suggested tying it potentially to uh, development aid from the U.S. or Europe. Uh, Adam, uh, I take it, is, is suggesting a, a softer approach, one that's all about sort of grounding the document in the region and, and, and uh, uh, looking for, for a kind of a more peer-to-peer a -peer, uh, approach within, within the Americas um, to kind of build the legitimacy more organically within, uh, within the hemisphere. Uh, do any of these ideas resonate with you? Are they things that, that the ICRC is, is thinking about or working on? What's your reaction to these suggestions? Uh, well, um, I, I was actually, um, actually going to give some elements of uh, answer to the question on good practices and, and the countries. Uh, and I'll try to, to uh, tie the, the two uh, questions. Um, We, we've seen that uh, in the events that we've, uh, to which we've participated in the continent, that the peer-to-peer -peer seems to work pretty well. Uh, countries of, uh, of uh, uh, same um, kind of uh, level of development, same kind of uh, uh, preoccupations, they're faced with the same kinds of preoccupation. The whole continent is not uh, obviously in the same situation, but many countries share some kind of Uh, some issues, um, and so the peer-to-peer -peer seems to, seems to work uh, good in 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 those situations. And we've seen that um, in some studies uh, to to answer the specific question on, on the countries that that could be uh, uh, presented as as uh, good uh, uh, showing good practices. Um, some studies have identified uh, Peru. Uh, as a very good uh, uh, example, uh, Ecuador, El Salvador, uh, Guatemala, and Panama have uh, each of them have legislations, national legislations that touch on uh, one or many of uh, the different aspects of the problem. Uh, one being the effective oversight of, of the companies, uh, the the way in which a company can obtain a license to uh, to carry out its uh, activities, uh, the way to acquire uh, weapons in an appropriate manner uh, that will be used uh, after that, uh, respect for human rights, obviously, um, and uh, the, uh, an effective designated authority, national authority, to actually make sure that the whole system works within its legal system. So um, these countries that I've, that I've uh, mentioned are uh, probably the ones that have a, I, I mean, I'm not going to make a, a ranking, obviously, but these countries, uh, in the different studies that have been done on the subject, usually come up uh, as, as having very good um, legislations or, or regulations uh, and institutions uh, addressing the different aspects of the, of the, of the problematic. Please. Hi, my name is Alejandra Silva. I'm from the Washington office on Latin America. Um, 
My question is specifically on Colombia. Um, there, the government subcontra uh, subcontracts private security for its national protection unit, which can create a problem for social leaders because a lot of the times these private security are um, former paramilitaries, and that makes the victims like very uncomfortable. So, how would you deal with that? And we had another question in the back. Hi, my name is Meg Bergensock. I sit on the board of the International Code of Conduct for Private Security Providers Association, and I wanted to commend the dialogue for their uh, attention to this, and also the Swiss government for their really uh, steadfast support of both the Montreux document and the Code of Conduct uh, process. As was explained, the Code of Conduct really is a complement to the Montreux document in addressing the responsibilities of private industry under humanitarian and human rights law. And I just wanted to mention this and reinforce that it is really important that we get more state support for this initiative. Of course, it's important that states be part of the Montreux document process, but they can also require of private security that they be members as a condition of procurement eligibility, both at the federal level and then also promote among companies using private security that they require that as a condition of their own procurement uh, processes. Companies that join the Code of Conduct commit to several things that are important here and that supplement what governments can do in terms of regulatory oversight. One is to have policies that align with the Code and the Code speaks to all of the requirements of international humanitarian and human rights law but also requires basic management systems be in place to ensure that these policies are implemented in complex environments that there is human rights due diligence and risk assessment around them. So the policies are informed by the operating environment. But it also obliges them to submit to periodic review, both desk-based review and field-based review. And we have actually done field-based review missions supported by um, the State Department's um, Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and, and Labor. Uh, finally, um, the Code of Conduct requires companies to have in place a grievance mechanism that aligns with the UN guiding principles, uh, uh, standards on effective remedy, but also um, does pose a role for the Code of Conduct where those um, mechanisms are not adequate to provide a mediation role. More broadly, I just wanted to say that um, what this um, uh, what this association provides is a supplement to what are some fairly challenging um, aspects of federal procurement law involved in managing uh, these relationships. Very often governments are reliant on these contractors. Their only alternative is to essentially cut off relationships. It's very difficult to get um, a clear understanding and to modify those relationships. The Code of Conduct provides some additional um, insight into that, greater transparency around the contractors that are being used, but it's imperative that we have more government support and more buy-in. We do have, within the Code of Conduct now, we used to have a member of the board from Trinidad and Tobago from the industry. We do not currently have a Latin American industry member, but we do have uh, a number of civil society members from the hemisphere, and U.S. and Canada are government members, and the U.S. Uh, sits on the board. The other point that I wanted to make, which has been brought out by the report in the panel, is that there is a relationship between public and private forces which is really um, worrying and uh, which the, import, the report importantly focuses on. Very often private security contractors are required to work with public security. Either they're um, prevented from using armed, um, uh, armed services or where they are allowed to use armed services, they're often patrolling with local police. Um, and then also in the context of any work that they may do of apprehending individuals are required to turn them over to competent legal authorities and that may be difficult to ascertain in a conflict environment. So um, I think it's also extremely important that we have greater transparency around that interrelationship and around the level of integrity about how those relationships are managed because of all the concerns that you've highlighted today. Thank you very much. Um, that's, that's a great contribution to the conversation and, and as you mentioned the Code of Conduct in Montreux are very much complimentary, and, and the point is made in the report as well. Um, let me turn to our panelists uh, for any reactions and, and final comments as we uh, wrap up here. Claudia? Sí, um, creo que como funciona la, la organización, Adam, igual tú puedes complementar desde tu yaro rol de secretario. Es eh, que 
hay acuerdos, consensos mínimos sobre un problema y su solución y eso se transforma en mandatos. Tenemos todavía un, un mandato pendiente, que es este mandato que emanó de la MISPA 1, la primera reunión de, de ministros de Seguridad de las Américas, sobre el que podemos, tenemos un, un gran espacio para trabajar y creo que debemos de trabajar y una tarea, una primera tarea es, es, es este entendimiento de hasta dónde está la regulación, qué tan adecuada es la regulación, cuánto se implementa esta regulación y dónde están los vacíos técnicos que podrían requerir de nuestro apoyo para que se dieran pasos como hemisferio en la materia. Creo que aunque este, el, el informe ayuda a transparentar mucho la situación, quedan aún como detalles por saber, porque el hemisferio es también más que América Latina, tenemos todo el Caribe que debe estar en una situación distinta y que no, no fue tomado en cuenta en el informe. Entonces quizás si me preguntas por eh, unos comentarios finales, diría que desde la OEA, desde la Secretaría de Seguridad Multidimensional, hay pasos que podemos y creo que vamos a dar para contribuir eh, en este esfuerzo hemisférico de una mejor y mayor regulación de las empresas privadas de seguridad. Muchas gracias. Adam. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, I think that um, we're only going to advance this file if this is seen as a legitimate, fully appropriated initiative of the region. Um, I mean, I've been through this enough to know that getting member states to implement the Budapest Convention, for example, uh, is not going to be easy because it was not given, they were not part of it. Uh, it was not fully appropriated. Um, as Claudia says, we have mandates, we have laws. I don't think it's a lack of laws and mandates. I think it's a lack of uh, implementation. And how do we develop the mechanisms to help member states implement the codes of conduct, the elements of the, of the Montreux uh, document within their stra uh, structures and strategies. Uh, because quite often there will be the law. It's, I mean, quite often people will want to protect human rights, obviously. But it's getting from A to B. Um, and I think that this is where the OAS uh, can play a role highlighting these initiatives, let's translate this into Spanish, let's put this on the agenda of the next MISPA, let's bring this up at the uh, La Comisión de Seguridad Hemisférica, how do you say that? The, uh, uh, well, the Security Commission at the OAS that meets every, uh, every month. Um, let's raise it at the General Assembly uh, and, and see where we go. Okay. And I would just like to say in Colombia, I think is We can talk for hours uh, afterwards. I think that's a case apart. Eric. Well, yeah, just to briefly conclude, um, I definitely believe that um, the, the, the more the uh, events are, are carried out, where states can interact uh, and uh, we get a broader um, signing a number of uh, signatories to uh, the, the, the multiple document. Um, obviously, the, the broader the ideals that are uh, within the document will, uh, will, will get to, to the whole continent. Um, and uh, we, we definitely believe that this is uh, the way to go ahead um, in order to get a all of these, uh, the principles uh, into uh, the different legislations that um, that we have in the whole, the, the, the countries of the continent. Um, and the challenges have been, are identified in the report, the, the, the priorities that uh, we need to address. So uh, I, I guess the question is now, um, it's, it's, it's time to uh, take that into account and, and really act on it. Great. Well, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. I want to thank you all. Um, 
Uh, it's hopefully a conversation that's just starting, um, and we hope that the report will be something that uh, that people will take with them and, and use and, and discuss. Um, we're very grateful again to the partnership of, for the partnership of the Swiss Embassy in this, and look forward to continuing to, to work with you, Charlotte. Um, thank you all for being here, uh, and please join me in thanking our excellent panelists.